we ended our last conversation with you saying that it is only the ones who have everything that can actually play. Because the one who is full before he arrives is the one that asks for nothing from the game. And when a human being has no need, he is free. And when he is free, he becomes untouchable, which leads to this whole idea of being legendary that you continue to talk about. Unpack that for me a little bit. I think everyone looks at uh, their craft and, and their sport and their business and whatever their pursuit is as a place uh, from which to get something. Um, it's sort of a, a wishing well of sorts. And that, that creates a lot of problems because the field, the, you know, the, the field of play doesn't really have any power to give anybody anything. So everyone, you know, tends to have, in general, um, a hole that they're trying to fill. And that hole is filled by success or by wins or by money or by status, um, whatever it may be. And that, that really creates an enormous problem because then they're beholden to the outcome uh, to decide how it is that you feel about yourself. So that means that how you feel about yourself and what's your state of so-called happiness or joy or peace, whatever it is, is always in the hands of someone else or something else. And that's really slavery. So one of the things we've talked about in the past is your ability to let go of the outcome, right? To have the mindset that to approach any endeavor with having the outcome being a byproduct of the pursuit. It's tough as hell to get to that, especially when you got a lot riding on the line, whether you're in sports or in business. Where do you start to get to that level? Well, it's tough to get, it's tough to get to that if you are viewing it as a prescription. It's not so tough to get to that if you come to the conclusion that you have no other choice. Everything is tough when it's viewed from, from the standpoint of a prescription. Uh, it's not only tough, it's virtually impossible because you're doing it because of a should. And, you know, if, you know, you, you might be able to give away some secondhand clothing uh, by way of a should, but you're not going to give away the family jewels by way of a should. So for you to give away the family jewels, you must see no other option. You're not going to do it because it's good for you or because uh, the rule book says that you should. Let's not assume it's a prescription, right? Let's assume. Well, but it has to be. It has to be, though. If it's, if it's, if it's that difficult, then it is being pursued from the lens of this is what I should do and this is what I'm supposed to do and this is what I've been told is a good idea because it may benefit me down the road and this is a good habit to get into. And those are very cosmetic things. Those don't have the power to uh, allow someone to give away the family jewels. For someone to let go, you know, this, this is all like sports psychology, you know, you know, really just hot air, you know. You know, be in the present and, you know, give, you know, um, uh, forget about the outcome, let go. And what, what no one seems to understand is that the only reason that you're being told that is because it's an ulterior motive to help you play better. So it's all, it's all a trick. And the mind recognizes that trick. So it's just an ulterior motive. It's just, it's just an avenue to get somewhere. It's a means to an end. And because it's a means to an end, it has no power. It isn't done genuinely. It isn't done 
because the person arrived there and, and discovered that if I don't do it, there is incredible ruin. And that ruin is not something that I've been told about that theoretically may occur in the future. I've experienced that ruin. I've experienced how my life is completely in shambles when the outcome of a tournament uh, dictates how I look and feel about my life and my profession. So everything has to be genuine. I, it, it, you can't come at it through prescriptive means. Um, so I, I think that's why it's difficult. It, it isn't just difficult. It's, like I said, it's virtually impossible. So none of us are immune to the feeling of elation when we've succeeded. At the same time, mm-hmm. none, of, none, of, none of us are immune to the fear of failure, right? We're not in your headspace yet. You know, if a business fails, I mean, unless you're Yoda, you probably feel really bad about it. Do you want that mm-hmm. feeling? Are you referring to that feeling when that feeling gets so bad? Is, is that where I have to go in order to be able to get to that level of uh, mind share where I don't give a damn about the outcome anymore and with that I am on a path that to that legendary status that you're talking about you know n- no one ever looks at where they are because they're so busy looking at where they should be so No one ever looks to see what are the consequences of the way that I view things. What what are the consequences that I've all, not that I will experience, but that I've already experienced. I mean, everyone's looking at the results of whether the outcome of the game or the business turned out. Well, what about the results of, the way in which you've been looking at the game. What about those risks? What about the consequences, not of the game, but what about the consequences of the way that you've been looking at? It? So, so you, you know, you talk about, well, if the business fails and the person feels bad, well, that isn't the first time that they've felt dejected. They've been feeling de- dejected the entire time. It wasn't just when it failed. When it failed, they felt the dejection of failure. But all along, they've been feeling the dejection of fear. So why is it that no one's looking at that? Why is no one looking at the fact that, why is everyone looking at the dramatic climax? Why are they not looking and saying, but you know, for the last 20 years, I've lived in fear and anxiety. So that's already happened. That isn't something that's going to happen. That's, what, that's, that's where the person has been living. So why not look at that outcome? and say, well, why is it that I've been living in fear and anxiety for all these years? And then ask that question. And then that will take a person to the place where he sees, well, I've been living in fear and anxiety because the way in which I've been looking at the game is completely detrimental um, to how I feel. It's, It's not sustainable. That is the road of truth. Not... Not, you know, the, the hysteria over how can a person lose his company and still not be dejected. Forget that question. Look at where the person already is. Now, your question would be valid if you said, for the last 20 years I've been building a company and I've been joyful and peaceful the entire time. And then when the company failed, then I became de- dejected and that was the first time. Only when it failed. I would say fine. Now, that's a valid question, but that isn't happening. Everyone's distraught from beginning to end. So why not examine the level of distraughtness that the person's been swimming in for years? No one's looking at that. I totally agree with you. Right? And I want to c- come back to that in a moment, but you triggered something in me because one of the great insights that I have learned from you and that you provided me is this idea of access. And you brought it up in one of your last podcasts where you talked about, hey, these people who you consider elite, they don't have a problem 
with acquiring new knowledge or new skills. What gets in the way is accessing those skills. So yeah. is, is that what you're talking about here with the ability to be able to access that by asking myself that question? No, I mean, that, that's different. I mean, you don't have to access it. Maybe when you ask yourself the question, it's just the nature of the question. I mean, instead of asking the question, why, how can I not feel dejected when the, when the company fails, rather than, ask, rather than asking that question, ask the question, why do I feel dejected already, all along? That's the question. So as for skill acquisition versus skill access, that's a question of performance. So when, so when someone is not performing well, um, the performance community and the coaches and the sports psychologists and the business coaches and the motivational speakers and whoever it is, they're all talking. They're all singing the same tune. They're all well. You, they're all talking from the standpoint of well. You have to go back and work on your technique, and you have to work harder, and you have to improve your skill. And well, if that okay, let's, let's once again look at the evidence. If that was the case, then they would never play well, right? If it was a question of skill acquisition, then they wouldn't have one great game and then three bad games. Where, where would the great game come from if if the skill wasn't there? If it hadn't been acquired, we're the great, it shouldn't have any great game. But that isn't the case. They'll have great games, and then they'll have a bunch of lousy games. So, so that means, so according to that logic, when the person had the great games, the skill was there. And then when they had lousy games, the skill disappeared, and now they have to go back and learn the technique all over again? Or relearn so something. I, Wow, you relearn? I mean, do you relearn tying your shoes? If you've been doing something for 25 years, you have to relearn it? When just last week you performed fantastic? So, so between last Wednesday and today, you lost the skill? It, like you were walking down the street and it just, it just, it just drifted out? Well, don't you believe, you do you believe in complacency that at some point success becomes more of a curse? That's a different question. I'm talking about where did that skill go between last Wednesday and, the, and today? I'm sure it's still there. All right, it's That's a matter, right. it's, it's so a it's matter of there. me recalling it or accessing it like you're talking about. Right. That's my point. So if the skill is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere. So if the skill is still there, why is everyone working on acquiring the skill again or acquiring more skills? Why is that the question that is being asked? That doesn't make any sense to me. So what's the question that you're asking? Why is it that I'm not able to access it? And what often gets in the way? I know it's Everything personal. But Everything but technique. You know, so, so let's, you know, let's, uh, if, the, if the bleeding's in the head, you know, we'll get to what part of the head the bleeding's in, but can we first move away from the leg? Sure. Right. So if everyone's already, if everyone's already going back to the coach or to the, you know, to the business guru or whatever it is, what do I have to do? And what's my five step plan? The business then, guru, right? Because you know, the business guru has all the answers. Well, the business guru has all the prescriptions. <laughs> and we all right? fall for it. So, it sells books. Yeah. Well, well, not only fall, people ask for it. So, so no one really gets anywhere. This is all just a scam. <laughs> everything in the, everything in this society is a scam. From the government to the FDA to sports coaching to uh, business coaching, it's it's all a farce. It's, there's nothing real here. It's just swirling muddy water because no one and it has nothing to do with intelligence. There's nothing to do with people not being smart enough. There's nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with that. It's, no one's interested in asking the, the effective questions, the real questions, the questions that actually get someone somewhere. Because everyone's interested in working on stuff all the time. Everyone's interested in practice. And everyone's interested in uh, you know, following sort of the guidelines of what to do and what you should do. And everyone's got a you know, technical instructor and everything. It, it, it's, 
it's it's sheep following sheep. So help me drill down a little bit then. Help me drill a little bit deeper from that purity aspect that you talk about. Um, just in general, what is it that we can start to do to try to get closer to getting away from these prescriptions and focusing on the real truth that will enable us to be more successful, to achieve greater heights, to be happier, whatever it is that you will ultimately define as legendary? Um, I think, I don't think it has anything to do with what you need to do, because that will be another prescription. I think it has everything to do with the idea that to ask yourself if you're really serious and to give yourself an honest answer. And it's a very honest answer to say that I'm not serious. Um, the, the truth is very, very few people are serious. Well, and we started off with three people, and then we, like last time we said five. So there's five, five people <laughs> on, on the planet now. <laughs> and I hope I'm one of them. So. Right. <laughs> Uh, okay, so for those five people, um, if you, they're really serious, then I'll say, okay, uh, it, just please don't believe anything that I say, because um, I don't believe anybody. So um, don't ask anyone to believe me. But Kapil, um, we do believe. Look at the, but, but that's the, that's the no, truth. But, 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 but just look at your own life. Look at your own life. I'll tell you the to so For the five people, wherever they are in the world, if they're listening. Look at your own life and um, examine honestly and innocently all the prescriptions that you followed in, you know, for purposes of your life and well-being and your business and your profession, whatever it may be, and uh, see where it's gotten you. See if it's got, see if it has gotten you to an arrival. See if it has gotten you to a permanent state in which there are no more questions. See if it has gotten you to a holy grail. See if it has gotten you to a place where you don't need any more how to. Examine for yourself. That's, just, that's my honest answer. Examine well, I, for yourself. I'm going to answer because, for because the if you five don't people. do that, if me... you don't do that, then you then you won't then you won't move genuinely in away from prescription. Let, let me answer for the five people starting with myself. No, of course it hasn't gotten mm -hmm. me to where the Holy Grail or a level or a state of permanence. No, of course. That's why okay. I am okay. intrigued and incredibly appreciative of the perspective that you bring to the table. And so if that's the case and it hasn't gotten you where you would like it to get you, then you will naturally fundamentally and organically move away from prescriptions, not because I say so, but because you have found for yourself that it hasn't gotten you anywhere. And as you move away from prescriptions, what will begin to happen is that your questions will begin to change. They will fundamentally change because now you're not looking through the lens of a how-to anymore because you have realized, not that you shouldn't, but you, but because you have realized that looking through that lens of how to doesn't work. And so when someone's questions begin to change, then the people or the situations um, that may provide the direction for that person also begin to change. It's like a Rubik's cube. You change one face. And all the faces change. What is the context of the questions that you started to ask yourself when you started to sense that shift? You know, my questions are more, much more along the lines of what is the source of the, uh, of the matter? What is the one thing that fixes 12? As opposed to fixing 12 things, right? Um, what is the most fundamental truth upon which all these problems exist. That if that fundamental truth was realized, then everything that was resting upon it would fall away. Well, is that... It's it, never in, in the realm of the how-to. Yeah, well, I, I think we all get that now. <laughs> we definitely all get that. 
But when you look at these elite people or when you look at these high achievers, uh, the world looks and starts to say that, hey, what distinguishes these individuals from others is that it starts with talent. However, I'm continuing to be convinced that really it isn't talent. It's upstairs, like you say, it's their mind or their mindset. One, is that true? Do you see that as the fundamental thing that that distinguishes these super elites that you're talking about from the rest of the world? Does it start with their mind? No, it starts with talent. So it is. So so you do agree then with that? Well, but what distinguishes? Well, my agreement only goes so far. (laughs) Of course. uh, The the departure coming very very soon. Uh, So. Um, if you, but if you look at if you if you look at within a population of elite, like within a professional, uh, uh, you know, basketball arena, or within you know the world of professional sports, so there everyone's very very talented, okay? and so there what separates one from the the, the, the the super elite from the other elite, that mind. But what separates the whole, because your question was, Got it. what is it that separates the elite from the rest of the people? Got Let's it. count. Yep. But within that domain, it's the mind. Got it. So, so take me to that space then. What is the mind like for those that are in that ultimately in that legendary state that you're going to talk about. Is it no mind? Yeah. Well, I would say it's DNA, first and foremost. I think some people are just, their sensibilities are different. The things that they, um, the things that attract them are different. The things that they gravitate towards are different. The places that they want to go um, in terms of their vision for their career is different. Um, the way that they'll do even things outside of their profession will be different. Now, I and I and I think it's a I, I think it's a mistake to start looking at these people and following their habits. No, I think that's just I, I, I'm so against all that stuff. You know, the seven habits of effective people, and that's just it's just. Well, okay. it's, always, it's always the number I mean, seven yeah. for whatever reason. It's always seven yeah. something. Yeah. yeah, it was always, you know. So, it, it, and no one should like try to be that, right? Because I think there's talent within everybody. Um, but, you know, why is there one who's super elite? Because his DNA is different. But if I don't have that you know, DNA... Do I not have a chance to get to that level that you're talking about? Uh, what I'll say is that if you have, if you ask that question, that if if a person was to ask that question that I don't have that DNA, but I really want to get the very fact of asking that question implies that he has some semblance of that DNA, because the people who truly don't have that DNA are too oblivious to even know that they don't have it. Because, like, I don't even know what this DNA that you're talking about is. Well, DNA, that's to be a legend. I want to be the greatest ever, right? I want to be in the history books. I want to, um, you know, where everyone, wherever everyone is in my craft, I don't want anyone near me, right? I don't want to, you know, I want to I walk my own path. I don't follow any rules. I don't listen to stupid coaches, right? I don't need all this instruction. I, I, they do everything against the grain. They're, they're, they are, they are, um, they're heretics, right? They're revolutionary. They're that type of DNA. Do, do they not have goals? I mean, don't, sure, don't you consider... Goals, the, I mean, so isn't that like, I want to be the best in my craft or I want to be, you know, the greatest who do, or, or, you know, have more gold medals than anybody? I mean, do you consider that a goal? Because I know you're not fond of goals, you know, I mean, you could retrofit something and then say, well, is it, can you consider that a goal? I mean, you know, by goals, I mean, I don't, you know, by this time I want to accomplish this and by this time I want to accomplish that. 
that's sort of what I mean. I mean, um, but when someone wants to be a legend, I don't mean it's less, less, less of a goal. That's just who the person believes himself to be. Mm-hmm. That's what he feels like he was put on this earth to be. Like it's almost his birthright. So I mean, so I don't, like I said, you can, you can turn any English word into anything. Okay. But I'm talking about it from the most colloquial use of the word goal. Um, that's what I was talking about. So one, when one of those people comes to you to be their coach, advisor, whatever you want to call it, and you agree to work with them, what's the first question you're going to ask them? I have no idea what the first question is. I, n- I never know what I'm going to ask anybody. I have no idea. <laughs> because I, I it's done a script. I don't, I don't know anything. I, I mean, just whatever comes out, comes out. But what do you want It'll to know about them? What, you know, I will, I will know who they are by the questions they ask. I will know who they are by, um, if it's a face-to-face meeting, mm-hmm. how, how still and how, and with, with what sort of look they look at me when I speak. You, you will pick up on all these cues. Sure, absolutely. Uh, that's when you know that if someone is truly serious um, or this is not for them. Were there some interesting questions that you got asked recently that uh, distinguished some people who were no, serious? I, from either, I never remember it. I don't remember anything. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I just, I mean, those, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's far more beneficial if you listen to sort of the flavor of what I'm saying as opposed to looking for, you know, the, the detail of, you know, the example. So what do you mean when because you say... you'll find your own example. So, so talk to me a little bit about what you mean when you say performance is never a goal. It's always a byproduct or a side effect. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if your goal is I want to play better or I want to perform better, that's an ulterior motive. But that's a natural that implies, goal that most of us pursue. Well, but that 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 implies that very that that very tenant implies that I should be doing something, some form of a doing that'll improve my performance, and that never gets anyone to the top. Sure, it might improve your performance, and even then it. But even if it improves you today, it'll probably, you know, it'll be less improvement tomorrow because the mind will figure out an antidote to whatever your new trick is. So that's why every trick has a shelf life. And that's why every red pill is followed by a blue pill. True. Absolutely. Okay. So it isn't about how can I perform better. It is about what are the problems and what are the things that I have not realized that have hampered my performance? That's a fundamentally different question Mm -hmm. because one is tell me what to do. Give me some five step plan or some stupid hack that I could, you know, utilize to get, you know, 5% better. And the other one is the other one has the potential of blowing the doors open by way of understanding. So are you always competing against yourself then? Is this always a commitment to yourself? I don't yourself? compete. No, 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 I don't compete. I'm just constantly looking for the truth. I'm constantly looking that, you know, is the thing that I've already found, is that truly rock bottom? Or is there another level more fundamental than that? So what do you say then when, what do you mean when you say competition is for those who've not mastered and they're left with nothing but to compete. What is that? What is that? Well, well, the person who masters, I mean, if, if you master darts and you can hit the bullseye every time, why would you compete? No one, there would be, you would have no competition. So competition you, you is show up to a tournament, people. you show up to the Olympics and you're not competing. You're just huh? going to go do your thing. Well, why would you, I mean, from the outside, someone could say, oh, look, he, there's one person and there's 10 others. They are competing. Mm-hmm. I guess you could say that. 
But but if you hit the bullseye every single time, you don't you don't have any competition. So internally, right? competition competition is for the people who have not learned how to hit the bullseye every time, and they're getting together to compete to see who can get closer. So competition is like fighting over a half eaten sandwich. Competition is fundamentally for non-masters. So what do, what do masters do? Masters master. They don't look to beat anybody. They don't look to better anybody. And it, it, it isn't because that's not nice. You, you know, never go down that road, either, right? I don't know about nice and good and improper and everyone gets, a, you know, a trophy for playing and all that silliness, you know. It, it's, in my view, anything can be mastered. There is a way to own it. And because that's my view, that will naturally be my pursuit. If my view was that competition is the way, then naturally my pursuit would be to go and practice and out-practice the other in hopes that I could get 2% better than him. Mm -hmm. So whatever your view is, that's what your pursuit will be. And that's why your view and the, your, the lens through which you see, see things has real consequences. So do you see the whole pursuit of chasing success in whatever shape or form a real problem for people who are chasing it? Yeah. Do we get just handcuffed by that? Yeah, because what they're chasing is really the fringe benefits of success. They're chasing how to better another. And ironically, bettering another means that you are limited by the other person because you will only do just enough to inch past him. And once you have inched past him, you'll stop. So you'll never know how good you think it. Mm -hmm. So competition breeds mediocrity. Yeah, I, I live in that space. I believe I really, and, and over the last year or so, you have convinced me of that. So I'm, I'm there with you. At the same time, I also realize that as human beings, to get to that state that you're describing, that the five people really, really want to get a glimpse at, there has to be an element of fear, of letting go of everything that I've done in the past that at least gave me a taste of what success is like in order for me to try to pursue, um, you know, maybe a more appropriate or permanent way to live uh, in this state that you're talking about. Fear is real. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get rid of for a lot of people, right? It, and I assume that the people who are at the level that you're describing maybe are not immune to it, but deal with it differently. No, I, I, I don't think there's a problem. I think what matters is what you're afraid of. That's the problem. See, if you're afraid of not becoming a success, that's a problem. If you're afraid of not learning the truth, that's not a problem. That's a very good problem to have. Because whatever you're afraid of, that's what you're going to make sure doesn't happen. So if you're, if you're afraid of losing, and if you're afraid of not becoming a success, then you'll go down the path of hard work and struggle. If you're afraid of not learning the absolute truth, and that's what you're truly afraid of, that how good you could have been, then you'll go down the path of mastery. So the nature of your fear has consequences. So do you measure progress? How do you measure progress? Or do you? No, I don't measure progress. I just measure what, uh, did you get to where you want to go or not? Well, in business, if we've got these super ambitious goals, we may not ever get there, but we get closer. Is that thumbs up or I don't thumbs think down? It's about the goal. I don't think it's about the goal. I think it's who you believe yourself to be and what you believe your destiny is. 
what you believe to be your birthright, who you, who you feel that you were put on this earth to be. I don't think it's about goal. So you, you have talk of goal when you have all these committees because committees are drivel. Whenever you have more than one person in any situation, it's going to be drivel. That's why last time when you were asking me about boards and stuff, mm-hmm. they don't know anything. Mm-hmm. They don't know anything. They, they don't. They, 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 may, they may know what they want, but there's no, there, there isn't a single group in the world that has wisdom. Even if you go to a Buddhist monastery, that group doesn't have wisdom. There might be one guy, and it probably isn't even the head guy, who has wisdom. Groups are a dumbing down phenomenon. Groups are a regressive, re, a regression to the mean phenomenon. There's no effectiveness. Well, I mean, the only effectiveness coming out of a group is, you know, if you want a big, if you want to lift a big heavy log or a tree or something, you know, there's power in numbers in that sense of muscle power. That's fine. Whereas one person couldn't do it alone. That's, that's, that, that I understand. That's fine. But anything that's on any sort of intellectual level or anything that's non-mechanical, um, groups will always be filled with mediocre people. But you can't. Because if there's, if there's, if there's one brilliant person in that, in that group, he will be eaten alive by the mediocre. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're dead on on that. But how the hell do you build a great business, an impactful business, or build a great sports team without having yeah. a group that's working together in some way, shape, or form? Well, yeah, you know, I, you know the, uh, I think the team is really a false construct. Um, there's no team. From the outside, it looks like a team, but each person within that team is a perfect individual who is the best at his particular thing. So the group and the team, that's only an added societal label. You know, the, the guitar player isn't helping the, the piano player play the piano while he's doing guitar with his left hand. Mm. Right? And it's only when one is purely individualistic and sticks to the perfection of his own craft that a symphony is created. If everyone's meddling in everyone else's business, then it would be a disaster. So, is that. So, yes, it, 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 it's parallel play, it isn't really a team. So does that then, then the first thing that, that, that comes to mind is Bill Belichick and his approach to say, just do your job. If you just do your job, the cumulative effect of everybody doing their job, we're going to win. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And, and you know, and here's the real consequence of, of, of this team myth is that, you know, in youth sports, you'll have someone who's really good at a particular position. But he'll be told that he needs to play different positions as well. Mm-hmm. You know, that's stupid. You know, this is, you know, you're just being coached by people who fundamentally don't understand. Well, why? If your talent is in this position, for whatever reason it happens to be, right? That's the talent that you've been given. Then that person should be taught to maximize that 500%. But that isn't, but see, that's not fair. That's not considered fair. Everyone should get a chance to play in that, and everyone should get a participation trophy, right? And <laughs> it, it's it's a stupidity, right? If you are if you are if you are great at center, why would you play defense? You shouldn't. Sure. At all, ever. You shouldn't. Now, if you're, no, if you're no good at center, then it makes sense to switch around to find out. Maybe you're, you're an amazing defenseman. That makes sense. But see, this, this, see, ignorance has consequences. If you believe in this team myth, then naturally you will do 
silly, stupid things like take people away from their natural talents so that they get worse at what they're really good at in order to make them a little bit more mediocre at what they shouldn't be doing. Those are the natural results of believing in things that fundamentally are not true. Ignorance has consequences, real-world consequences. This ruins people's lives. And do you feel leaders building and growing companies can follow the same approach of, hey, do your job and that mentality and build a great business? Yeah, but I would think that the leader would have to, would have to first um, ingrain that with it himself. Because in general, leaders tend to be too interested in what others think of him. Yeah, true. And that's a big hole that that leader needs to fill before he speaks a single word to anybody else. Because as long as he is influenced by what others say, as long as he has insecurity about how he may be viewed, then he will not be anywhere near his... In, near his, his ultimate with regard to the, uh, the performance that he can put forth. But do you feel that we could be totally immune as in, in leadership positions to what others think of us? Of course. Yeah, they're not a whole lot. But, of not, if you live in, but, but, but not if you live in this world of prescriptions and you think that and you think, if you have to follow 18,000 rules, no. The answer to your question is no. Then it's impossible, okay? If you're worried about what the Wall Street Journal is going to write about you and you're worried about what this, you know, you know, social group is going to say about you and you're worried about being nice and kind over here and not step on anybody's toes over here, and, you know, if, you, if you're going to follow all those rules, and I tell you, you might just quit your job and go sit home because you'll be more respectable doing that. Because you're just you're 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 a little man in a big chair, who is just sitting in a, some stupid post, and who is not anywhere near exercising his full capabilities and his full talent. And so, what's the use? Well, sometimes if the right Wall Street Journal writes something that's detrimental or negative about me or my company or about me in particular. I mean, that could have some negative consequences. So at some point, so, that's got to be in the back of my mind. Well, if, if, if you sell out on your talent and doing what you believe that your instincts tell you is the pure and appropriate way to go, and you don't do that because you're afraid of what the Wall Street Journal might say, then you're an insult to your talent. And I can guarantee you one thing, that by, by making that concession, you will, you will have sold out on something that might have led to something really big. At the end of the day, you've got to be able to face yourself in the mirror. How many journals are you going to run from? How many reporters are you going to, you going to hide from? Or... We could just say it's fake news, right? <laughs> Whatever the hell they write, we could just say it's fake news. Um, yeah. well, you know, the, 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 the greatest source of fake news is what's going on in the leader's head. Of course, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's probably the subject of, of everything else that we're talking about here. But let me just ask you a couple more things and we'll kind of uh, pause this one. When you're talking about, I want to just stick with this leaders in a moment. Um, I was fascinated by your the depth of discussion that you had about purity and, and the importance of coming from a place that's pure. Do you just, when you're around others or with yourself, do you, is that a feeling that you get of your level of purity about whatever it is that you're thinking or, or contemplating? And do you see it in others? I mean, if someone, if, if another person is pure about what they're doing. Um, uh, yes, you can see that. And do you feel it in yourself when you're, when you're asking yourself the type of reflective questions that you're asking yourself and really deep questions? Do you just know that, Hey, that this is really the essence of who I am? Yeah, I would, I never do a solo podcast. 
until I'm ready to speak just purely, regardless of who may like it or who may not. Um, the, the arbitrator, the thing that I must be true to are, are my, are my deepest instincts of purity without a single, without a single drop of an attempt to put on a show or to, uh, be an entertainment or, um, you know, to, to play to any crowd that, that is simply uh, unacceptable to me. One of the things that also resonates with me and certainly the, the four other people and, and the people who at least listen to these conversation, uh, they know that you are an independent thinker and you are definitely contrarian. But do you ever run ideas by other people? Like if you feel like you need to get someone else's perspective on something, anything, how do you pick the people in your inner circle to have discussions like that with? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, absolutely. If, if there's a topic or if there's something that I don't know, then I will ask a per, I will, you know, research an individual and find out what sort of things he's written and then give him a call or write him something or whatever it is. And, but, but that's just the first stage. Um, I will know whether he's real or not, by how he responds. I, I, just because I'm asking him doesn't mean that my filter isn't on full blast. Mm -hmm. Because the, 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 the truth is that the chances that I've stumbled upon someone who is truly, truly speaking the truth is you know, one in a million. Right? So I already know going in, I, I really, really am looking forward to the possibility that this might be the guy, um, but I kind of already know that it, the chances are fairly remote that it is going to be him. But if he speaks truth, I'll know it immediately, even though I may know nothing about the topic. It isn't topic specific. What is you it You just then? know when someone, it's just, you just know when someone's speaking the truth. You just, you, you just know it. You, you, you can, you know, it's, it's, you know, you can sense fear. You can sense someone holding back, not wanting to go against the, the, the status quo. You can sense someone uh, intentionally going against the status quo uh, for purposes uh, just to show off. You can sense uh, where someone is uh, has really, really looked into the matter uh, outside of just having read the material that's published about the matter, but mm -hmm. looked into it himself and felt. I mean. So there's, there's a thousand little things that, that you can, that, that we as human beings can sense that someone's speaking the truth. And do you find that experts, real experts, really don't flaunt themselves, right? They're not out there talking about or profiling themselves as experts. I mean, that, that seems to be a red flag. Everybody's an expert nowadays. Right, right, that's true, yeah. Yeah, most experts aren't really experts. Um, mm -hmm. People are experts based upon what they've read. And the more that they have read about something, they brand themselves as an expert because they have read. But all the things thing is that they've read, first of all, a lot of times weren't written by them. And even people who were, they were written by, they've derived it from other sources themselves. Mm -hmm. So everything's nepotism, right? Like true originality is extraordinarily rare. And, and I think part of the reason is, and, and it isn't necessarily even that there aren't truly original humans, because there definitely are. But what happens is that but the truly original humans also have to have the DNA to not be afraid of what the world thinks of them. And so that's, a, that's sort of a, you know, a sort of a two-pronged attack that's required, because if a person doesn't have the DNA to say what they want to say and, and without being uh, afraid of what the world, you know, might shoot them down, then they'll, they will regress to the mean or they'll just stay quiet. I mean, that's obviously what happens to most of the world, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. freedom right. looks very different to somebody who's has real expertise in something and somebody who just claims to be an expert, right? The former never talks mm -hmm. about it. I don't know. I don't think there's, 
I don't think it's you a never talk me. about really being you, you never talk about you know the depth of knowledge or the depth of expertise or you know that I you never talk about that yeah I mean yeah I mean I don't because I I don't I don't know there really isn't that strong desire in me to really impress anybody you mm-hmm. know maybe that's why but whatever I want to say I, I say it and do you consider that for others who feel that way? Is that, have they gone away from that insecurity of gaining others' approval and other, the opinion of others and so forth? Have they gone away from that and are really more focused on, you know, the direction that somebody like you is heading? Is that that, is that, that total free, freedom of the mind that, that you had described a couple of times? I think there's definitely freedom in genuinely not being interested in what others think of you. I think that's a massive milestone to reach in any human being's life because, um, because that sort of imprisonment is toxic. Really, absolutely. I mean, that, that really ruins your life. Um, because you do everything in order to get, but, but, but even the, I mean, no one really does that for other people. For the people who are afraid of what others think, they're not doing it for the other people. It's, it's that they are afraid of imbibing what the others may think of them. Mm-hmm. And that's so a real feeling. Think, I mean, that's real. Yeah. I mean, it's not real. It's fabricated, but it's believed to be real. But we feel it, at least the, you know, yeah. the, the, not, yeah, sure. with the exclusion Absolutely. of the five people, <laughs> we feel it. Yes, no, yes, yeah, no question. Now the, now the big question is, or, you know, maybe we leave everybody with how do we, once we have that feeling, what the hell do we do to try to gain that sense of freedom that, you know, that you describe? Um, that only becomes possible when the, toxicity that one feels in being in that position is greater than the toxicity one feels of leaving it. Because because when you're in that position, uh, the, the, the desire for acceptance and validation is greater than the a version of the toxicity that that situation creates. It's euphoria for a lot of people, the great majority of people. So the greatest desire always wins. So when the desire for validation is greater than the feeling of toxicity for being dependent upon others' approval, then it's impossible to leave that space. 